Hey y'all, I'm Halto. Uh, I'll be talking to you guys about how to hide malware uh, to get past antivirus. Uh, full disclosure, I haven't looked at these slides since the summer, so we're going to kind of wing it. Um, real quick, some definitions. Antivirus is a tool that's used to detect malware. Uh, Packer is something used to scramble malware. Uh, Cryptor is something that is used to encrypt malware and bypass is a way to avoid. Uh, I'm going to talk mostly, eh, I'm going to talk about static and dynamic analysis. We'll talk mostly about hiding your signature and then a little bit about sandboxing and what you can do to get around it. Um, for the signature, these are kind of the main ways you get around it. Uh, number one, Right, you need code each time, so I don't go into Meterpreter or, or Metasploit and do use payload, fucking whatever. Uh, polymorphism, great tool, Mobfuscator, if you can get it to work, 10 out of 10. Um, packing encrypting, so a common one in Metasploit, Shikata Um It's really complicated. It's got a lot of math going on. You can talk to Nick about it, I'm sure. He likes that stuff. Uh, and then XOR encryption. Uh, for sandboxing, to bypass sandboxing, you're going to consume a lot of resources or use unique identifiers about a system. Uh, so this is our control. Oh, boy. This is for Windows with a sample bind TCP. Um, nothing trying to hide it. So only 13 things found it. So yeah, AV sucks. Um, this is the same thing for Linux, <laughs> even worse. I got four. <laughs> uh, so first we're going to try hiding our signature. Uh, in the immortal words of Taylor Swift, being unique is beautiful. All right, so the main thing you get by writing your own malware is that your code is unique. Uh, so there's not going to be just a hash laying around where you can like do lookup tables and just, oh yeah, I know that one. You got to actually kind of go through, look at the bytes, see what's in there, see if you recognize any of the strings in there. Um, one of the, people get really tripped up, especially when they're using like the Metasploit payloads because they're all the same. Uh, and so usually AV will just see that right away. Um, Another thing, so a lot of AV uses like a point system. So if it sees so many points that it thinks are malicious, it'll flag it and quarantine it. And then you have to go pull it out and run it again. Um, but so specific function calls are sometimes flagged. So if you're doing specific things that are bad, like um, I think a lot of things that are doing like network calls can be malicious. Things that are doing like exec calls are malicious usually. Um, yeah, polymorphism. Uh, so when you're trying to do polymorphism, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to make your your bytes in your code different. So when you take your C program and you compile it, you take all of those instructions, gets assembled into assembly, and then compiled over into um, bytes. Uh, so over here, we have an example of four different ways to do the exact same thing. Does anyone know what this is doing? Quentin, what's it doing? Setting a register zero. Um, XOR is XORing the register against itself. Move is moving zero into the register. Subtracting is subtracting it from itself. And IML is multiplying it against zero. That's exactly right. Yep, we're just saying it's zero. So that's just a really simple example of like different code doing different things. Uh, with like a polymorphic engine, it'll take it and it'll try and translate all those things into different these things. Sorry, that was a terrible sentence. Um, but this is Mafuscator, which is one way to do it. So instead of um, the example I just showed you, uh, instead of using those four different ways to do it, it only uses mob. So if you have a jump instruction, you don't have a jump instruction anymore, it's using mob and then mob again and that's how it's going to do its jump. Um, so I have sample code right here from our bind TCP. Oh, this is is prime. So this is a checking prime function. 
uh, and then I ran it through Mofuscator. Uh, it got a lot bigger. Yeah, it was super consistent, like just mob. I like it. Yeah. And then we have Taylor Swift dancing awkwardly over there. Yeah. Um, so for this one, I didn't, uh, nothing detected it, um, but it also didn't do anything <coughs> malicious when I ran it, so I think I just broke it. But we're going to count that as a win. Um, Packers encryptors. Now, this is where I spend most of my time. Uh, so this project started because I, at work, we were running into issues with Windows Defender, where it was catching all of our payloads. And so I was like, ah, this is stupid. AV sucks. We're going to, we, we can get around this. And so I started writing this, and uh, Windows Defender doesn't suck. Windows Defender is pretty good. Um, but the two main parts of uh, a packer or a cryptor are the payload and the stub. So over here is the payload, and that's all of the malicious bytes that you have. Uh, in their packed or encrypted format. So those hex bytes, those are all instructions that have been packaged. Over here is our, ah, oh, it's really low on the screen. There's a main function down here that decrypts and then executes. So it runs through this decrypt function, saves it in a buffer, and then it executes that buffer down here. Um, so, it's like if, uh, it's like if I had a script and, like, I'm in a play or something, and part of my character is to write out a script and then play a character who reads that script. So it's kind of like uh, code execution inception. Um, yeah, what's up, Brad? Yes, if you set the stack executable bit when you compile. Dash Z, X, Z, stack, and FNO protects, and yes. You have to <coughs> a little bit, but it'll work. I promise. I wouldn't lie. Uh, so here's Shikata Ganai. Uh, it translates to it can't be helped. Um, but it was a really, really good uh, polymorphic algorithm when it came out, but since it's come out and become so widespread, uh, AV devs have just started flagging it and the process that it uses as malicious. Um, so that's kind of a bummer. But if you're really interested, this is kind of what it's doing. So it's taking this, so these are the same, and then those are the same, and then these are the same, and then those are, the, yeah. You can look at it if you want. It, yeah, we're moving on. Um, for Chicago and I, this is our uh, same package from earlier um, that had 13. It now has 12. So we fooled one more. We fooled Clam. Let's go. <laughs> uh, for Linux, it eh, doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> we're just done. We've, we've, we've won. Um, so after that, I started getting into writing my own because I didn't want to use Chicago and I. I wanted to have my own thing that I knew worked 100% of the time for everything. So first thing first, XOR. Uh, we're going to encrypt everything so that there's like no possible way they can do it. They'd have to break the encryption. And I don't think AV devs are going to go and break XOR encryption. Granted, it's not hard. I just don't think they're going to do it. Exactly. It takes time to do that. So up here again, we have our buffer with all of our encrypted bytes, encryption. And down there, if you can't see, there's a little main function calling encrypt with my password, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, so it'll do that, and then it'll print it out so I can copy paste it over into my payload, which is this. Uh, and so again, we have payload up here, which is encrypted have our decrypt function, and then down at the bottom again, the decrypt function and execute, the buffer. So we have our um, execution inception happening. Uh, on Windows, we got down to 5. So we went from 13 to 12. Now we're at 5. Let's go. 
still at zero. <laughs> All right, we're going to move into sandbox detection, which is not something I've really, really done, but I read about, and I think it's cool, so I wanted to share what I've read. Um, so the first way we're going to do it is resource consumption. So a sandbox is like a little environment that it tests things out in, where it can play safely, like a real sandbox, where you put your kids in. Um, the first resource we're going to abuse is time. If we have a program and we just make it run for a really long time, then uh, it's going to give up because it can't sit there all day running your program. It has to move on and do other things for you, like run your web browser or you know whatever else you're doing, Pong. Um, so if we just make our program last forever, it won't execute. Uh, a good way to do it would be like check the time that it's downloaded and then execute a week later. Or what you could do, oh, I don't know if I should be giving like explicit ideas out on stream, but it's all right. Um, too rich attack, consume too much uh, like memory. So most sandboxes don't have the same size VM, like memory space as your actual system. So if you allocate like four gigs, the sandbox is just going to say, I can't do that. We're going to move on. It's not worth it. Um, you need a host identification. So this is getting into like, we kind of know something about the host. Like if you know who, the username of the person who's going to be running this program, you can check for their home directory. Uh, yeah, check for their home directory. Um, check the number of cores. Uh, way back when AV was first starting out, it used to be that everything ran in one core. They've gotten a little smarter now, and a lot will run, or at least say they run, with two cores or four cores. Um, so that's a little less common now. Uh, you can check the amount of memory it has allocated again. They're not going to have regular system sizes, so you can't. Uh, so if you check and it has less than like two gigs, uh, it's probably a sandbox or a Mac. Network callouts. Um, this is checking to see if the sandbox allows networking out. So some won't, some will. Um, if your callout works and it gets the data that you're expecting from the page back, um, you can kind of guess that you might not be in one. Um, if it doesn't call out at all, then you're in trouble. And yeah, the only thing to consider when doing this is that some AV will consider callouts like this um, an indicator of maliciousness. And so they'll add points to your malicious score. Okay, cool, that's it. Anyone else? Anyone have questions? Hi, Stuart. How do like, sandboxes try to prevent this like, excessive time? So, I don't know how they prevent. Uh, the question was, how do sandboxes check and prevent uh, too rich attacks like time and memory? For memory, I have no idea. For time, um, I don't know that they do. One of the things they could do is they could just lie. Because uh, they, uh, they control the, system, the calls you're making, um, they can intercept it and say, yes, it's this time or it's that time, um, which is what they do with cores. So like, it will probably only give you one core to execute in, but it will tell you two or four. Anyone else have questions? Um, say a sandbox is lying and saying you have more cores than you have. Is there any way to work around and change how many cores, say, by using threads or so on, to see if you actually have the number of cores it's saying you have? So Quinn asked if there is an empirical way to check how many cores you have in the event that a sandbox lies to you. Um, yes, probably. I haven't tried it, but yeah, probably. Anyone else? Cool beans dudes? <laughs> 